All right. Hello. Hello. Oh my gosh. 18 of you in here. Okay. <clears throat> hello, everybody. This is Melissa, the insurance exam queen. I already feel like I'm going to get hot. So I'm going to take this jacket off. Hello. Hello. Okay. Let me, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me know what states you guys are in. So let's see. We have, okay. When we start with the exam, Ac life, accident, health. Yeah. Accident. Sometimes the states will call it life and health, and some will call it life accident and sickness, but accident and sickness are the same as, as health. It's not any different. Hello, Florida. Okay, we got Florida, Maryland, Kentucky, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Florida, lots of Florida people. Kentucky, James, you're not going to have a fun time of this. <laughs> <laughs> Kentucky is um, one of the more difficult states because um, Kentucky decides to do their own exam, meaning that they uh, pick what the breakdown is and what they want tested on each chapter. They don't follow like a national plan, if that makes sense. And in Kentucky, you have like 20 chapters and each one is only like 4%. And that can be really tricky because you have to learn all of this material and they're only going to ask you like four questions from each chapter. So Kentucky can be really difficult. You kind of got to know it all with Kentucky, which is why I would definitely recommend getting my life and health boot camps, that, uh, recorded classes that are available for sale. And we could get the links in the comments if you guys don't have them. Um, can this be recorded? You can. Uh, if you can record it, go for it, but <laughs> it'll be on YouTube forever. Um, so this class that we're having right now will be available on YouTube. You might be coming back here to watch the replay. Hello, if you're watching the replay, um, that's fantastic. But yes, this will always be available. Um, and speaking of which, uh, I do not have as many of you uh, life and healthers as I do property and casualty, which is why I chose to make this class free so that it could just be on YouTube and available for everybody. Now, I don't 100% know how it works, but I know there is a way to drop um, super thanks or super likes or super chats, something like that, where you can actually tip as the class is going. So I super appreciate that. If you're able to make a donation tip um, throughout the live stream, there's like super chat, super like, something like that. I'm now well versed on YouTube, but I went live one time and somebody tipped me money. I was like, oh, that's cool. So if you guys are able to do that, that's awesome. That's why I'm running this class for free. This is also my first time running a live class on YouTube to kind of see, you know, how this works and how this goes and to get some learning done. <clears throat> okay. So talked a little bit about Kentucky. Thank you. Got sick kids. Got to go. Yes. So this will be on YouTube forever and ever and ever. Amen. And I have no reason to, to delete it. So this will always, you can always come back to um, watch this. Okay, so let's talk about what state you're in is going to determine how you study. Now, ultimately, at the end of the day, when it comes to life and health, whether or both life, health, whatever, whatever state you're in, they do focus in a lot on term versus whole. Um, and then a lot on provisions, life provisions and health provisions are one of the biggest focuses on the life and health exam. Uh, and those two never change. So there are two main test providers. You are either in a Pearson state or you are in a Prometric state. So if you've already scheduled your exam or you've already taken it before, what website did you use to schedule it? What did the website say Prometric or did the website say Pearson? That will determine which outline and which breakdown you are following. And you can know, and, and if you also, if you don't know, I'm going to drop a link here in the comments. This is a, and I've I never, never taught on YouTube before. I don't even know if I could share my screen, but I might do that. I might try to figure that out at some point. I think I could share. No, I can share my stream. I don't think I could do live yet. I don't know if I have, I'm not live, but <laughs> share my screen. Yeah, I don't think I have that capability in here. Um, okay, so click the link that I just dropped and it's the preparetopass.com. When you click on that, it'll take you to a list of a bunch of states. So I'm going to click on Florida because we have a couple of Florida people. As soon as you click on that document, the first couple of pages will tell you about getting the license in your state. 
um, at least the first two, yeah, the first two pages. Then you get to the third page and it should tell you if this is a Pearson view or Prometric since it is, come here, puppy. Come here, come here. Mommy wants to help you, come here, come here. You got it? Go ahead. <laughs> I have a little tiny seven pound chihuahua trying to jump up on the couch. Okay, anyway. <laughs> on the third page, it'll tell you Pearson or Prometric. Most of you are going to be Pearson because that's just the number one test provider out there. But if you are studying a Pearson view exam, so everybody go check, 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 put it in the comments so you know, check, check your state. Um, Pearson, yeah, Michigan is Pearson. Pretty sure. Are you sure? Michigan, I'm pretty sure is Prometric. Let me look. PSI. Okay. So Michigan is PSI, which actually does follow up. There's another little thing. There's two main test providers, Pearson and Prometric, but then there's another one PSI. And then some states have their own, like Kentucky and California have their own. PSI will either follow Pearson or Prometric. They're not their own separate thing. So that's why I generally say Pearson and Prometric because they um, are the two main ones and PSI will just mimic or copy either Pearson or Prometric, depending on who the, the state was with last. That's kind of not important for the state exam for your purposes, but the states themselves will flip-flop back and forth between who they're using as their provider. For a couple of years, they'll use Prometric and then they'll switch to Pearson. So, but those again are the two main test providers. PSI will just copy whatever the last test provider was. So you're going to follow more of a Prometric outline with um, PSI. Okay, so everyone's checking Prometric, PSI, okay? So the when you look, if it says PSI, the next thing I want you to do is what is, does it have a chapter called general insurance? So if you have PSI and there's a chapter that says general insurance, you're gonna be following everything I say about Prometric. So if you have PSI and there's a chapter that says general insurance, you're going to be following what everything I say about Prometric. If you see PSI and there's not a chapter that says general insurance, but there is a chapter like completing the app or, or field underwriting, that would be Pearson. So if you, and if you're struggling to know, just drop your state and I, I can tell you, cause I, I can look it up real quick. Okay. So it looks like everyone's pretty much got their state. Okay. Most people are Pearson view. So with Pearson view, when we have a Pearson view breakdown, I'm going to drop it in the comments right now so we can all see it. So this only applies to people if you're in a Pearson view state because they are different. They will all generally focus on term and whole and provisions. Those are the three main things on any life, on life exam. On health, it's always... Um, HMO, PPO, and provisions. That's a big one for, for health. But anyway, okay, so this, I'm dropping in the comments right now a link to explain uh, testing for Pearson. So if you click that link and you're in a Pearson view state, it's going to tell you what to focus on for your state. And I see that a couple of you are in there looking at it. Awesome. Okay. With uh, the Pearson view... Well, and with any of them, really, life and health will overlap a lot. So for instance, you may have, if, if you're taking Pearson, you're going to have a title called completing the application or a chapter titled completing the application. And then you'll have a, a chapter titled field underwriting. Completing the application is for life insurance. Field underwriting is for health insurance, but they are almost exactly the same. So whether you're reading the chapter about completing the application or you're reading the chapter called field underwriting, they're almost the same. Same with life insurance provisions and health insurance provisions. So provisions are the way we do things. So like um, one of the provisions on the policy is that a policy will come with a free 10-day look period, meaning that once you buy your policy and you have it in your hands, you get 10 days to look it over and review it 
And if you decide you don't like it, you can return it for a full refund. That's a, the free look period. It's pretty much standard 10 days across the board. Um, now that is true for both life and health. It's a provision that you get on both life and, and health. So when you're taking the life and health exam, you want to double up on the things that are going to be the same between the life side and the health side, because they're going to give you the content. They're going to give you everything to study for life. And then they'll give you everything to study for health. And then a lot of it overlaps without realizing that it overlaps. So what I like to do is focus on the overlap which is why I curate my products and services, my recorded classes to focus in on those things. So if you haven't already, um, you can you can buy my past recorded classes that teach these, these concepts. So if as we're looking at the Pearson breakdown right now, it talks about how life and health is separate, but there is a lot of overlap. So we want to focus on the things that overlap. The two main things that overlap a lot are completing the app and field underwriting. Those are almost exactly the same. Those are available in my four hour life boot camp. Then we have provisions, just like the free look period. Now, life has a lot more provisions than health does. There's a lot more rules and things inside life insurance than health, but many of them overlap. So I also spend a lot of time teaching provisions. And in many states, it's up to 25% of the exam. So then I have a couple of provisions classes. Then when it comes to health insurance, so life, term versus whole all day long. They love to ask you questions about term versus whole. I know that when you read your life insurance chapter, what whatever course provider you have, um, Excel, um, Kaplan, AD Banker, Passport, whatever they are, um, which, by the way, I recommend Excel. And if you use coupon code, if you use the coupon code QUEEN when you check out, you'll get $10 off of your Excel course. And within 24 to 48 hours, you will get a link to my all access pass for your exam. So that's a great way to save money because instead of buying the course and then also buying my recorded classes, you buy them all at once and you, you save money. Um, and that's if you buy Excel with the coupon code QUEEN. Um, so anyway, and then you need to be pretty decent in state law. Now, state law is different for everybody because every state is different. And in fact, this is a test question. Who runs insurance? The state. The state is not run by the police or a president or Congress. It is not federally run. Federal is president and Congress. State run more like governor, mayor. That's the level of insurance. So insurance is a state run thing. Well, there's 50 states, which means there's 50 sets of rules. There's all kinds of stuff that can be wrapped up inside of those chapters. But what I do is I focus in on the things that you definitely need to know and which things you should focus in on. So I have a 1.5 hour class recorded that's available that teaches what is important for state regulations. And I will highlight for you which numbers you need to memorize, which things that you need to know. <coughs> and then you could buy all of that together in one big package. So that's for Pearson. So again, um, let me check the comments. Pearson, PSI. Oh, no. California is its own little thing, but it kind of, I think it follows more of a Pearson breakdown. South Carolina is Prometric. Maryland. Oh, I can't remember Maryland. Let me look at Maryland. <clears throat> Maryland. I'm going alphabetical. I can't find the alphabet. Maryland is Prometric. So Maryland is Prometric. Um, I can't look. It takes me out of the video. So I'll check after we're done. All right, Audrey, <clears throat> did you tell me before? Prometric, if I'm correct. Prometric. Okay, you said Prometric. Oh, thank you. All right. I don't see what state you're in yet. Maryland. Okay. So I just said, Mar didn't I just say Maryland? I did. Okay. So Prometric. Yes. You were right, Audrey, that it follows a Prometric um, outline, which by the way, now we're going to talk about Prometric. Okay. And please make sure you're asking any questions um, in the comments. Uh, I'll, you know, I'm here. So talk to me live. We'll, we'll chat it out. In the chat box where you write the text is there is a money sign and you yes again this class is for free i'm leaving it available up for donations and super likes or super thanks something like that on youtube 
Um, so somewhere it's right under the chat box. There's like a little dollar sign. You could click that and you can drop a, um, tip, donation, whatever you want to call it. The property and casualty class that I'm having on Thursday, they had to pay $33 to show up. So you guys are getting this for, for free. Um, and it'll be on YouTube forever. Okay. New York, New York is also prometric. I'm pretty sure I got, I got a lot of them memorized, but I'm not at hundred percent. There's 50 of them, you know, got to give me some grace. New York is prometric. Yes. And I actually took the New York exam. It's a lot, it's a lot more straightforward than you, than you might think. Okay. So let's talk about prometric. So now I'm going to drop the link for prometric. And if you have a prometric breakdown, your focus is going to be a little bit different. Um, of course you, again, you always focus on the main stuff, term versus whole and provisions, HMO versus PPO and provisions. Um, but you guys have a little bit more uh, chapters than Pearson does. So I just dropped the link. If you are in a prometric state, you're going to want to click that link. That would be New York. That would be South Carolina. That would be Maryland. Um, PA, Pennsylvania is also a prometric outline. I know they may be PSI, but they, they follow prometric outline. Okay, so now let's talk about prometric. So again, we want to... You guys have some more chapters. You guys have extra stuff you need to know that the other guys don't. You need to know general insurance. Now, general insurance is generally relatively easy. It's not super difficult. Um, and I have a couple of, I have two different things on general insurance. One is where I just explain the material. So like, I'll give you the word, you know, law of large numbers. I explain what it means, maybe give you an example, whatever. The other, and that's called the conversational audio. Then I have a memorization audio where I will explain the thing, but then I will repeat a sentence that you should remember three times so that you can hear it, you know, in your head being repeated. And then you can also uh, write it down as you're listening to it. So general insurance, you, you want to know that one. Now, for some of you, general insurance may only make up like five to 10% of the exam but it's easy. It's easy to get those 5%. And it only helps you understand everything else later on because you have this whole general insurance chapter that teaches you about the basics of insurance. So whether it only makes up 5 to 10% of your exam, it's good stuff to know. So that's the general insurance. Um, then we want to focus on, again, on the things that overlap. So life basics and health basics overlap as well as life provisions and health provisions. Now, what's really funny is life basics and health basics is exactly the same as completing the app and field underwriting. So this is to my point. A lot of people will ask me, Melissa, are you teaching to my state? What about my, my state? I'm like, y'all, your states are the same. <laughs> They're the same and different. <laughs> so the bulk of the content, whether you're in Arizona, California, Pennsylvania, Illinois, no matter where you are, the bulk of the main content will be the same. And I always focus on the bulk of the main content. I focus in, on, in exactly on the things that are going to require that for a pass. I don't try to shoot for 80%. We don't need 80% unless you're in Nevada because Nevada re requires that you score an 80% on your exam. Michigan is usually like 73 to 75. Most states, though, are 70%. I'm not, I'm not out here to help, help people get 80%. I'm out here to get people get a pass, whether that's a 70, a 71, a 72. <laughs> that's all we need to pass. So in fact, I actually had a student from New York um, and he was studying so much uh, of, on the information and he was like, I need to know this. I need to know that. I need to know that. I'm like, no, you don't. No, you don't. You don't need to know it all. You just need to know this, this, this. And he focused on those things that I that I told him to say. He went and took his exam. He passed it with an 80-something because he was way, way studying. And he's like, you were right. He's like, the main things I asked about were everything you said. That's all I needed to focus on. I didn't have to do all this extra stuff. And I was like, I told you that from the beginning. <laughs> but now he he learned it. Um. So, oh, Wisconsin, I see that comment in there. Wisconsin... Y'all have a fun time in Wisconsin because Wisconsin is a 35% state law. 
And the reason I have that memorized is because one of my first royal treatment clients. So I started with doing one-on-one -on -one tutoring with people. And um, it was fun, but it was definitely time consuming and didn't allow me to really build out my business and spread myself all over the internet because I was too busy meeting with the one-on-ones. So then I stopped doing one-on-one -on -one tutoring. I started doing recorded classes, but there was still a good amount of people who said, I just want to be able to work with you one-on-one. -on -one. I don't want your recorded classes. Well, they do want them, but they also just want to be able to talk to me and, and be able to work with me and have me be their, their teacher tutor. So I rolled out a royal treatment package. And this is where you get to work with me for up to a month. And one of my first clients who did that, she was in Wisconsin and she had been studying for her Wisconsin exam for over a year, was not succeeding, not passing before she found me. She found me. She goes, I just want to be able to pass. And I, she, and we set up the, the package. She paid me a thousand dollars and now I charge nine ninety seven. <laughs> so I charge, I think I did charge her nine ninety seven. She tipped me $3. <laughs> <laughs> Cause we had talked about it being a thousand, but anyway, um, she worked with me for one full month. I told her exactly what I wanted her to do exactly what I wanted her to focus on. I sent her, which, uh, which my videos to watch in what order. And I said, I want you to do this like this. I want you to do this like this. I want you to do this like this. We're going to meet at this time. I'm going to see you on this date. We had it all set up, got everything in place. She was able to message me throughout the day. So like on your phone, um, there's a couple of different apps, either Voxer or Telegram, where we can audio message back and forth. So she worked with me for one month. Um, and even it was honestly more like two weeks. And she was in Wisconsin. And so I told her, and this is the plan that we took. And you can actually, well, I did a YouTube video on it on the day that she passed with her 71. And um, uh, our focus was, I was like, look, I don't want you to really focus on much. I want you to read everything and take the quizzes that are inside your course. I want you to watch my videos on repeat over and over. Then you and I are going to get together. We're going to focus on term versus whole, because again, that will be the majority of questions is term versus whole, not even all the others. I was like, I don't even care if you understand universal life. I don't care if you understand interest sensitive, adjustable life. You don't need any of that. You need term versus whole. And then for her in Wisconsin, I said, the majority is state law. So we ended up spending most of our time on Zoom going over state law since that was 35% of her exam. And she passed the first time with a 71. And that is important to me that she just passed. Like, again, my goal is not to inundate you with information. My goal is not to overwhelm you with all the possible things you may need to know and all the things that they test you on. My goal is to give you exactly what it is you need to know in an easy way for you to retain it. You eat it up, you put it in your brain, you pass the exam. That's how I roll. That's 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 me, that's my jam. Um, so that's a royal treatment package that's available. If anybody wants to get that, let me know. Um, and you can work with me again for up to a month. My neck, one of my next royal treatment clients, he actually did all four exams. So he wanted to do life and health and property and casualty. And so we knocked them out. We got them all done in one month. Again, I told, I said, I want you to do this. 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 When you get to this point, call me. We're going to have a meeting. We would have a couple of meetings. He would take a test in front of me. We'd talk about a couple of things and he passed his exams both time. No problem. In fact, what was really funny was he did, I believe he did property and casualty first, which is the harder exam. So if you're curious about that, property and casualty is a lot harder. You have to know a lot more. Uh, types of policies. You have to memorize a lot of things. Um, you know, HO2, HO3, HO5, HO6, HO8, HO9. You got to remember all these homeowners policies where in life and health doesn't really have that. So we spent a lot of time together on the PNC for the life and health. I sent him a list of what I wanted him to do and which of my videos to watch. He never even really called me to, to schedule an appointment. And for the, ne for the next rounds, and then he called and said, oh, by the way, I passed. <laughs> So we didn't even end up meeting for the life and health. He just used my videos and my instructions on what to, to focus on. And we never even ended up personally meeting and he passed his exam and he felt totally confident and it was great. Uh, so yeah, that's my, that's my focus. That got me onto a Wisconsin tangent. Okay. So we're still talking about Prometric. So again, Prometric, you've got life basics and health basics. Those are going to overlap. All of that is pretty much completing the application. What does the process look like from 
you're, you're working with the customer. You sit down at their kitchen table. You show them the application. You fill it out with blue or black ink. You give them the notice of credit. You talk about the ways in which you're going to look up their information, the MIB, medical exams, credit reports, all this stuff. Um, and then you talk about the underwriting process. So both Life Basics and Health Basics have all of that. Then in, in a Prometric state, you're going to focus on the life provisions and the health provisions. And again, those will look pretty similar. There are more life provisions than health provisions, but a good amount of them are the same. So that's why my um, both of my boot camps will focus in on that. And I have the provisions class. Um, and with health, so I focus a lot on life as I've been talking, but with health insurance, the main things to know is an HMO versus a PPO. And then also disability. They really love um, disability insurance. So those are always taught in my classes as well. And then you want to get um, state law. So those are the links inside the, the chat. You have both a um, Pearson breakdown and a Prometric breakdown. They will have the, the, the title on top so you know. And you can double check which state you are in. <clears throat> New York is a Prometric breakdown. So everything that I just said, you're, you're focusing on general insurance. And then um, types of life, light term versus whole types of health, uh, HMO versus PPO and disability, and then provisions, big time on provisions. Provisions usually makes up 20% of the exam for just life and then another 10, 16% for health. So provisions are a big one for uh, everybody. Okay, I spent six hours a day. Uh, how many days? So one of the things I was joking about, um, so <laughs> it's pretty funny. But um, there was a guy studying to, to take the exam. He was watching all my videos. He kept asking me to call him. I said, no. <laughs> For some reason, though, I did end up calling him. We immediately hit it off. He's the insurance exam queen's biggest fan. Um, so now he's my boyfriend. But um, <laughs> why did I go on that tangent? Oh, we were talking about how quickly we can learn the material. And I was like, look, I am trained, certified to be able to get people to pass this exam if you give me two days. You give me two days, you'll be ready. <laughs> so I can take you all, I could take you through all the material that you need for life in one day. I could take you through all the material you need for health in the second day. And you could be, and then you need about one day to take some practice exams and lock in the knowledge. You can be ready in three days. And so I was joking about how quickly I can get people ready. You don't need to, studying six hours a day. I mean, everyone's different, right? You, you come in. That's the kind of the thing about this exam. And that's that's what can make it a little bit difficult. So let's just talk. I can feel it right now. So let's just talk about this, especially when I say, oh, I can teach it in two days. I can. I can get you test ready in two days. But that's like, that's like I did that when you were you're at a corporate company, you're sitting at a desk for eight hours, and I'm just drilling information into you for eight hours a day for two days. That's not very pleasant, but it's doable. <laughs> But anyway, so let's talk about this whole exam process anyway, because one of the biggest things is your mindset and knowing that this test is hard. So certainly it is more than possible for somebody to pick up the book, read through it and be able to pass the exam because some people are just really good test takers and some people are able to easily retain the information with just reading it. The majority of people will need to take this exam at a minimum three times. State, a countrywide, 50% first time fail rate. And that's the average. There are some states that only have a 20% pass rate, meaning 80% of the people who take it the first time will fail. 80% will fail the first time they take it. It is normal to fail. It is normal to have a hard time. It is normal to have to take this many times. However, I plan to change that. The reason it's so normal to fail is because of all the false information that we put out there about how you should study. The number one thing people will say, and, I, and it grates me every time, and I avoid insurance groups for this reason, even though they're a great marketing tool for me, is anytime someone says they need to study or take a test, Someone will say, well, just memorize the practice exam. You score 80% on the practice exam, you'll be fine. I'm the one who had to answer hundreds of emails <laughs> from people who are saying, I scored 100% on a practice exam 
and I not able to pass the state exam. That's because that is not a good method. It may have worked 10 to 20 years ago when these people took their exam and they forgot about the exam and then they haven't touched it again, but it just doesn't work that way. There, it's very rare that you will find a test provider, a state course that will match the exam exactly. Because even if they do, they get shut down because the state test providers don't want courses giving out answers. Why would they do that? They want you to have to keep paying a test fee. <laughs> they want you to keep paying renewal fees. So they give out false information about how to study. Um, well, not, not even test people. But uh, so when I say book, Audrey, I just mean your state approved course. So whether you have Excel, Kaplan, ExamFX, AD Banker, when they have text, the text that you read inside your online course as you're scrolling, that's the book. It's just the text, the words, the things that you have to study. So whatever course you have, some states will require that you have a state approved course. You have to buy it from like an official, we are verified by the state of New York to offer this class to you. And some states don't have that requirement at all, but pretty much everybody is going to get a state approved course, which by the way, I recommend Excel. Excel, um, I, I, I worked for a different company for four years, traveling all around the country, teaching these exams. I was one of the most requested instructors because I could get people to pass the exam very quickly, very fast, saving people a lot of money. And I did that for the last four years. Now I'm doing it on my own here, insurance exam queen. By the way, drop some donations in there. I'm doing, <laughs> this is my new lifeline. This is my business. I quit the corporate company to do this myself. And that's why I'm out here on YouTube, you know, sharing videos, helping people in the Facebook group because I want to make this more accessible for people. And I don't want to be restricted to just the clientele that could afford to pay the super high prices to have an instructor, especially when I wasn't the one making that money. I wanted to be the one making all the money when they pay for a live instructor. So anyway, um, what was I saying about that though? <laughs> oh, Excel is a great course. So Excel has an exam that is more similar to what I have seen the state exam be like. So I have taken multiple state exams, Arizona, Nevada, Colorado, New York. I think those are the most recent ones. But so I've taken plenty of Pearson exams and I've taken plenty of Prometric exams. And I've seen the way that they ask questions on both. And Excel tends to just have questions that are more in alignment with that. So that's why I'm super happy that I partnered with Excel. So if you buy an Excel course and you use the coupon code QUEEN, you will get $10 off of your online course. And within 24 to 48 hours, you will get a link to my all access pass, which is basically every recorded piece of content that I have for life or health with whatever your content is. Um, uh, an Ania, I don't know how to say your name. I'm so sorry. You're doing personal lines on next Wednesday. That is awesome. Um, this class is for life and health. Although right now I'm kind of just talking about generals of taking the exam. Um, but make sure you come in. Oh wait, you're, you're taking it on next Wednesday. So like not like not tomorrow. It's today, Wednesday. No, not tomorrow. Right. <laughs> like a week from now, I will have a class this Thursday for property and casualty and the details are available um, in my Facebook group. And I think I also just went, I made a little tiny one minute, 30 second video about the, the class on Thursday. Um, Warren, are you doing, are you doing property and casualty or are you doing life and health? I've never heard of life and health adjusters. Audrey, exam FX is hard, but I, there is one thing I will say about exam FX is they do not give you extra stuff. So there are some state test providers like, oh, thank you. Look at that. Oh my gosh. Uh, Mil I, I'm going to say your name. I'm, I'm so bad at names. Um, Milligross Riviera, $20. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh. I'm like only fans with keeping my clothes on. I love it. <laughs> anyway, I could start an only fans, but YouTube is fine. <laughs> You could do OnlyFans with anything, I think. Um, okay. Okay, but William, is it, Warren, is it property and casualty? Oh, it's all lines. 
Those are weird. I'm not that familiar with adjusters exams, to be honest. Like I'm, I didn't ever do adjusters exams, but I've heard that with the property and casualty, the adjusters exam is very similar to my, um, property and casualty stuff. Okay. But I was talking about exam effects. Exam effects does not overload their material. What I mean by that is they really focus in on whether you're in a Pearson state or a prometric state. Other test providers don't really do that. They just keep all the information the same. And the only thing that they do extra is, um, is, um, state law, like, like Kaplan, for instance, whether you're in a Pearson or prometric state, everything you learn is the same until you get to state law. And then you'll learn state law specific to you, which means if you're in a Pearson state, and you're studying Kaplan, you're actually studying for a Prometric exam because Prometric has the majority of the content. You're over learning information that you don't need. Whereas exam FX will not do that. They only give you exactly what you need. The problem is, is they're not always the best at making it easy to understand, which is why I was one of the most requested instructors over there was because I could explain the information in a way that people could easily understand it and retain the information. Awesome. Oh, I'm so glad to help you pass your PNC and now you're doing your life and health. That's awesome. Okay. All right. So let's actually get into some life and health stuff. So if you are in a, um, <clears throat> got to keep my whistle wet. Um, <laughs> shut up. Look at this, my little fan over there sitting, chilling in the corner. He loves watching me watch all my YouTube videos. He's the reason I make so much money on YouTube. Oh, you done showed me. I might as well get in. You little stink butt. Anyway. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. So you need to get the business. I'm getting the business. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay. So life and health. Um, if you are in Prometric, you're going to have general insurance, which is things like what is insurance? What is risk? What is a hazard? Law of large numbers, implied, express, apparent, um, warranties, representation, stuff like that. I'm not going to spend time in this class going over that because only half of you would need that or, you know, a, a few of you would need that. So if you need general insurance, I do have two classes available for that. One is where I just explain it and that's the conversational. And then one is the memorization where I explain it and then repeat it a few times so that you can remember it. So if you're in Prometric, I highly recommend getting that or my all access life, which will include both of those. Um, and then if you, um, so, so Prometric, make sure you do the general insurance. What I'm going to focus in is what we'll see across all the exams. So whether it's, um, life, whether it's life and health Pearson or life and health Prometric, I'm going to be covering the thing that's, that's on all, that's on all of those. Um, Sarah patron, patron would be good versus, um, only fans. The only thing with subscribers though, and that's something I kind of struggle with is most people will be done in about two weeks. Um, the average person takes about two to four weeks to pass the exam. And I noticed that too. I mean, that's just the national average too. But also if you, if you're in my Facebook group, you'll see the, the bulk of people kind of change who's interacting about every two weeks, you begin to see new, new faces. Um, because it takes people about two weeks. So if they subscribe, you'd have to, you'd subscribe for like one month and then need to turn it off. So I haven't been able to figure out how to set up a subscription because most people are just done um, after a month uh, or two. <clears throat> okay. All right. Let's talk about let's talk about term life versus whole life. And I did bring my whiteboard. I would I didn't know how good it's going to show up on the um, camera. So let's see if we can do that real quick. The things, well, actually, let's talk about completing the app. Term versus whole. Let me see what this looks like. Yeah, that looks good. If we get it out of the light. Okay, yeah, okay. Okay, so at least that's available. Okay. All right, I'm changing my mind. I said we're going to talk about term versus whole, but changing my mind. We're going to talk about completing the application. So if you are in a Pearson state, this is going to be, and you're looking at that exam breakdown I gave you earlier, which by the way, I'll share it again. So you can look at your exam breakdown and you can see what it is that I'm talking about when I say the name of the chapter. So if you click that prepare to pass link from Excel and you click on your state, so let's say I click on like Florida, for instance, 
you scroll down to page number three um, or four. Is that PNC? No, life. Yeah. So you'll see the chapter titles, like the first one, types of policies and features, um, policy provisions, completing the application, underwriting. I'm going to be talking about completing the application. And then for health insurance, that's called field underwriting. So completing the app and field underwriting are same, same. Okay, same, same. One is for life, one is for health, but it's like pretty much the exact same information. Okay, so completing the application. So this chapter is focused in around you as an insurance agent. Oh, thank you, Gio. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. Um, so this, this chapter is all around you as an insurance agent. So let's talk about you as an insurance agent. Now, your job could be any number of things. Insurance is such an amazing, wonderful career that you could work all by yourself remotely. You don't even have to go into an office. You don't have to have a boss. You could do it all yourself. Um, you could work at an office. You can have a W-2 salary job. You could work at a call center. You could work with the team. Um, you could work with a remote team. Like there's so many options when it comes to, to doing insurance, which is why I just think it's just such an incredible career and opportunity for people. And not only that, the average income is 52000 a year. Now, there are plenty of insurance agents who are making over six figures, but there is also, but, but to know that the average, the average is 52, which is like almost double a teacher's salary, which is important having, since I was a teacher for so long, which is why I'm also so good at this is because not only do I have an insurance background, I also have an education background. So I, I'm very skilled at being able to explain and break down this material and help you retain it. I use a lot of methods that I learned as, you know, a middle school teacher because <laughs> with some of the best pass rates, because I was an actual teacher and not just an insurance agent. And a lot of the teachers out there are insurance agents who read the textbook to you. That's not very instructor. That's not very friendly. <laughs> That's just a book reader with some stories off to the side. I can't, that's not how I teach. I teach the actual information. I explain it. I break it down. I draw you a chart. I can't just read you a book. So anyway, I'm not even going to, I don't even have a PowerPoint. I'm not even doing any of that. I'm just talking through this stuff. Okay. So while your job could be any one of those things, working in an office, working remotely, uh, working with people, working by yourself, whatever, the state exam is going to pretend and this this will this was what will make the state exam in this chapter much easier to understand and absorb whatever your job may end up being you want to think of your job as going to that you're going to be calling customers you're going to be scheduling an appointment to come out to their house you're going to go to their house you're going to sit at their kitchen table and you're going to begin to explain the policies to them. So set that up in your mind as how you're going to be doing your future job. You may not be doing that, but until you pass the exam, that's how I want you to see your future job because it just makes it make more sense. So with the completing the application, the field underwriting chapter, they say that you're coming in to the person's house. You're going to sit down at their kitchen table with them. So set this scene in your mind because it's also going to help you when you're taking the exam, many people have said that they hear me in their head repeating a phrase or saying something as they're taking the exam. And another reason that that's possible is because I help set the scene for you is I make it very visual, um, graphic, whatever. When you're sitting down at the kitchen table and let's think about life insurance, um, because this is a life and health. I don't know if some of you are just life or some of you are just health, whatever, but let's say that you're, you're coming there to, to talk to a couple about life insurance. And let's say that they're a husband and a wife. They they have a house that they have a mortgage on, let's say a 30-year mortgage, and they have three small children. So your job is to come in and, and find out for them how well protected they are. What I mean by that is, what if one of them dies? How do they pay off the mortgage? How do they continue to feed their children? How do they continue to pay the electric bill? Do you have anything in place that will help protect you if any of these things were to occur? And if they don't have anything in place, 
That is what your job is, is to show them how insurance can be that that safety, that piece of protection that will make sure that if one of them were to die, that they would be taken care of. Because a lot of people say, well, we'll just put life insurance on the income earner. And if they die, then the life insurance will pay out. But let me tell you some child care ain't cheap. Whoever's taking care of the children at home, they may not be earning income, but they are saving money by not having to pay child care. So even if you have an, uh, a worker and a stay at homer, if you've got children, both people need to be covered because of any one of the income earner, we need to replace their income. The, the caretaker, the parent at home, we need to now pay for childcare. So we're going to have to have a whole new income for either a nanny or sending those children, you know, somewhere else. So both people need to be covered. And your job is to discover these holes is to say, okay, you're dead. What, how are you going to pay the bills? Right. You say it a little more gently, <laughs> but it is a conversation people need to have like really legitimately. And it's really unfortunate that people don't have these conversations because they're afraid of death. But whether you do or do not buy an umbrella, it's going to rain. So whether you do or do not buy life insurance, you're going to die. So you might as well buy life insurance. And this is one of the things that as an agent, you need to be stressing this with people. If you die tomorrow, is your wife going to go hungry? Are your children going to be able to eat? Right? It's very, very important. Rather than a GoFundMe, go fund yourself with some insurance premium. But anyway, so you're sitting at the kitchen table. You've got this young couple in front of you and you're trying to figure out, you know, if they're going to be okay. And also we might as well throw some, some disability insurance in here too, since this is a life and health class. So you have, as an insurance agent, you have the ability to sell multiple products, multiple things that can help protect people depending on how you set up your business. So you can come into a family, um, you, you know, like a, we have a young couple, they've got a mortgage, 30 year mortgage, they got three young children. One of them is an income earner. One of them stays at home. How are you as an insurance agent going to make sure that they're going to be protected if anything were to happen to any one of them? Not only do we have death, but we also have disability. What happens if the dad or the income earner, whatever, um, gets into, you know, an accident and cannot walk anymore, cannot go to work anymore. Now they're disabled. They were the income. They're not dead. They're still here, but they're unable to work. They're unable to bring in an income. You can solve that problem with the disability insurance. And we cannot just rely on the government social security because as we're going to learn, or if we get to it in this class, whatever, social security has a really strict requirement about being disabled. One, this is a te all testable points, by the way. Everything I'm about to say is a testable point for health insurance. One, the definition of social security disability is very intense. It says that in order for you to be able to collect a disability check from the government, your disability must, must last longer than 12 months and or result in your early death. So even if you're disabled for three months, let's say you're you're in a crazy accident, you have a full body cast, every bone is broken, but they're all going to heal and you'll be just fine once your bones are healed. You'll be fine when you're out of the cast, you'll, you can go back to work, but for those three to four months, you're unable to do anything. Social security won't work for you because social security says that the disability is expected to last 12 months or more and or result in your early death. So social security is out the window for most people. In fact, 75% of the people who apply for Social Security will be denied the first time. The other problem with Social Security disability is there is, again, testable point, five-month waiting period. So even if you do get approved, even if your disability is expected to last 12 months or more and or result in your early death, you have to wait five months before they send you a check. You have to take care of your own bills for those five months before you get a Social Security disability check. The other thing with Social Security is going to be kind of small. It's not going to be a lot of money. It's going to be based on your prior earnings, but it's pretty, pretty small. So Social Security isn't, isn't you know, relying on the government for anything. <laughs> it's never a good idea. So you as an insurance agent can be selling disability insurance 
two couples. How awesome to have both a life insurance um, license and a health license so you can take care of this family not only for death protection, but also for, for disability protection. And that way, no matter what happens to the family, they're going to be okay because insurance is actually about protecting assets. And what you're protecting is this a family's ability to earn money and then also their house and feed their children and stuff like that. So by setting up life insurance and disability, you're able to, you know, get that protected for them. So you're sitting at this kitchen table with this couple. You've got, you've got a husband and a wife, three young children and a mortgage. And you're going to be sitting there talking to them what is called the sales presentation. So you're sitting at the table. You're doing what is known as the sales presentation. What you need to remember, state exam question about the sales presentation is that it needs to be accurate and complete. Accurate and complete. The sales presentation must be accurate and complete. If they're going to ask you anything about it, that's generally the question they ask you. The sales presentation must be accurate and complete. So during this sales presentation, you're going to be showing them what's available. Well, you can get a term life policy. You can get a whole life policy. We can do a joint policy. We can do survivorship policy. You're going to be presenting to them what is available. And we'll get into the different types of life later. But they, they let's say they pick a, a regular policy. Your job now is to do what is known as completing the application. So you do the sales presentation where you provide to them what is available. They say, okay, I want to go for that one. Then you begin filling out the application. Now the application, testable point, main source of underwriting. The application is the main source of underwriting. Now there are a bajillion things. They're going to look at medical exam. They're going to look at medical information bureau. They're going to look at credit report. Um, and a few other things, APS, there's a few other things. They're going to look at a bunch of stuff. Okay. They're going to look at a bunch of things, but the main thing, the main thing is the insurance application. The application itself is the main source of underwriting for whatever reason, people will pick medical exam every time. No, that's not the main source. <laughs> this is not the main source. The main source is the application. The application is the main source of underwriting. Because even if they want to do a medical exam, they have to get the information from the application to begin with. So the application is the main source of underwriting. Now, what is the application? The application, and again, we're old school here for the purposes of the state exam. Remember, regardless of whatever job you're going to be doing, we're pretending that you're actually going to people's houses, sitting at their kitchen table, giving them a sales presentation of what's available, and then you begin filling out the application with them. The application is the main source of underwriting, and it's basically them filling out information about themselves. Who are they? Male, female, weight, um, just anything medical about you, your past medical history, um, and, you know, whatever questions are allowed to ask you on, they will ask you these questions in the application. Now, your job as the agent, you're known as the field underwriter during this time. So whether you're doing life insurance or health insurance, you are a field underwriter. Your job is to be the eyes and ears and working with this person to fill out the application. You know, and in fact, many of the States will say that you should be the one filling out the app. You ask them the questions and then you fill out the application because you know what goes on what line and what needs to be filled out. If, if, if they say you, they, 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 blah, blah, blah. they will either say you as the agent fill out the application or they will say the application is filled out under the agent's watchful eye that you have to be right there with them as they're filling out the application. And again, you're answering questions about their medical history and things that the insurance company um, needs to know as they're filling out this application. Many states will also emphasize that it has to be in blue or black ink. Modern nowadays, you're going to be filling, you're either going to be answering a phone call and filling out information in like a, like a, I don't know, a computer system whatever, whatever the profile systems are, um, or you might be filling out the information on like an iPad or something like that. 
you're not actually going to be doing blue or black ink. But the state exam is a little old school. So on the state exam, they want you doing blue or black ink and um, under the agent's watch for eye or the agent is actually doing it themselves. Now, with that application, what about if we're doing blue or black ink, what happens if we make a mistake? So again, setting the tone, we're sitting at their kitchen table. You offered them a sales presentation, which has to be accurate and complete. You're going over the policies that are available to them. They pick one, you begin filling out the application for it. And you're filling out this application in blue or black ink and you make a mistake and it's an in ink. Now, this is another testable point, whether your life or health, they're going to ask you this question. How do you make changes on the application? There are two ways to make changes. There are two ways to make changes on the application. There is a best way and a second way. <laughs> you have to remember best way, other way, because they're going to ask you a question. How do you change the application? And both answers will be available. And you need to remember which one is best <laughs> and which one is the other way. And then also pay attention to which one they're asking for. So if the question says, what is the best way? You better answer with the best way. If they say, if, if the best way isn't possible, what's the other way? Then you're going to say the other way. So make sure you pay attention if they're asking for the best way or the other way. The best way is to actually crumple it up, throw it away, start fresh. So they say that the best way to change an application is to just throw it out and begin a whole brand new presentation. So that's what they say is the best way. The other way is to draw a line through the error and have the customer make an initial. And it's very, and so, you, so let's say it's about weight and you put down 150 pounds, but you're actually 180 pounds. You would cross out 150, you would write 180, and then you would have the customer initial, not you. The customer, the applicant, they're either going to say the customer, client, or applicant. The person who is applying for insurance needs to be the one to make the, the signature change, okay? In fact, oh, thank you, Greg. I appreciate that. Um, they may also um, ask you a question that says who, they, they may word it like this. You went to a customer's house, you fill out the application, you return to your office, which is an hour away. You're reviewing the application before submitting it and you see an error. You call the customer and they tell you to go ahead and make the change and sign it for them. What do you do? And then you're going to have answer choices, A, B, C, D. Pick the one that says, go back in the car and go get the signature because you cannot sign it for him. Even if they give you permission, you cannot sign the application for the customer ever, either an error or a regular signature. Because that's another thing too that we'll talk about at the end. Every application needs to have a signature on it from the person who's applying. So you filling out the application under the agent's watchful eye in blue or black ink, you make an error. There is a best way and an other way. The best way, draw a line through the error, have the customer make an initial for the change. You as the agent, are not the one to make the signature. It is the cut and it's initials, not signature. Um, the customer is the one to make the initial. Okay. So you're filling out the application, make any changes that you need to. When you're done filling out the application, you're going to tell the customer, okay, now that we have filled out this application, I am going to submit it to the underwriter. Now you're the field underwriter. And then there's another underwriter. So what's all that about? At an insurance company, the underwriter is the person who actually makes the decision. And I like to call them the, the desk underwriter because they're the ones sitting at a desk. They're not out dealing with the customers. They're not at the, the customer's kitchen table. They're at the office looking through all the paperwork, looking at the application, looking at the medical exams, looking at the credit report, looking at the MIB, and they're looking at all these pieces of information to determine how risky the, the applicant is. Because insurance is all about the transfer of risk. And if you're going to give me a big old risk, I don't want it. 
or I'm going to make you pay a lot of money for it. So the underwriter is the one who's assessing the risk. How healthy is this person? Are they likely to die soon? Are they likely to live a long time? Are they likely to get sick? Are they likely to file a false insurance claim? These are all the things that they're looking at. And this is the company underwriter who's doing all of this. So the company underwriter is the one who's looking at all the pieces of papers, all the the exams, the MIBs, the credit reporting, all of that. And they're determining how risky a person is and then what their premium will be. And if the insurance company is willing to cover them at all, that's the company underwriter. You are known as the, the field underwriter. The field underwriter is not a true underwriter in that you're not the one making a decision. You're not the one analyzing risk. You're just the one in the field gathering the information. So you're the one who's getting the information that the company underwriter is going to use to determine how risky that person is. So you're the eyes and the ears. And so let me give you an example of what that means. Let's say you're sitting down with a customer at a kitchen table and you get to the question that says, are you a smoker? And you're ready to put yes, because you see an ashtray over there. You see some yellow haze on the walls. It smells a little smoky. Maybe you see some uh, pack of cigarettes in their pocket. They're like, nope, never smoked a day in my life. <laughs> you're like, okay. <laughs> you may ask them a couple times, are you sure? You sure you don't smoke? And if they say, no, I don't smoke, you're not going to sit there and argue with them and call them a liar. You're going to put, okay, no. Then you're going to end up doing what's called an agent's report or a producer's report. So they call it both. That really is tomato, tomato, whatever. Agent and producer are the same anyway. Um, it's like saying tomato, tomato. Agent, producer, producer, agent, same, same. Agent's report or producer's report. This is where you will say, I asked the customer if they smoke. They said no, but I had many indications that they were a smoker. You may need to look into this. The agent as the field underwriter is taking the, is gathering information for the application to then submit to the company underwriter. And if there's anything that doesn't seem right, being the eyes and the ears, you're there in front of the person looking at them. And if something isn't in alignment, like if they're like 300 pounds, that they keep saying they're 150, you're not going to argue with them. You're just be like, okay, fine. But I'm going to write a little note here <laughs> that says, you know, hey, check into this. I don't think they're being honest about their weight. That's the producer's report, the agent's report. What is super important to remember about the agent's report or the producer's report is it does not become part of the contract. So there's a provision in both life or health called entire contract. An entire contract says that the entire contract is the application and the policy that the application was used to get. We call all of those the entire contract. So a life insurance policy is a contract, whether it's life insurance, health insurance, property insurance, car insurance, whatever, Every insurance policy is a contract. So entire contract is saying it's not only the contract and the policy, but it's also the application that was used to get the policy. And they refer back to the application, especially in the first two years, because they're going to ask you medical questions and they can deny anything that like if you have a history of cancer and you put that in your application, they can say that they won't cover cancer. If you die from cancer, they're not going to cover it because you put you, because you have that as a, as a problem. Um, so they, they like to have the application and the, the contract. When they staple them together, they call them the entire contract. The producer's report, the agent's report, will never become part of the entire contract. I like to think of it actually as like a secret message between the field underwriter, the agent, and the company underwriter, because the customer themselves will never see it. They'll never see that you wrote down that they're definitely a big fat liar and they definitely smoke cigarettes. They're not going to, they're not going to, that customer will never see that. So the producer's report, the agent's report is not ever part of the entire contract and the customer will not see it. It's just the field underwriter, you as the agent who's gathering all the information you have the eyes and the ears to see if what they're saying matches up to what you're seeing. And if it's not, that's what you put in the producer's report or the agent's report so that the company underwriter, the one who actually makes the decision, 
will have all the information available to them. So you tell the customer again, let's set the tone. You're at the kitchen table. You have a young family. They have a 30 year mortgage. They have three small children. You want to get them set up on life insurance so that if either one of them dies, then they will get enough money to pay off their mortgage and make sure that their children have plenty of food to eat, maybe even pay for their college. If, if you want to wrap that up into your life insurance, you certainly can. So you're sitting at the kitchen table with them. You go over all of this with them. They say, yes, I want this, this insurance plan. You begin filling out the application in blue or black ink under the agent's watchful eye. Any mistakes that are made, you have the best way, which is crumpling it up, throwing away, starting fresh, or you have the other way, which is drawing a line through the error and having the customer initial the change, okay? So you finish filling out the application. You may or may not do an agent's or producer's report, depending on what they told you. Now you're about to leave their house and submit the application to the field underwriter or to the company underwriter. You're going to tell them one more thing before they leave, which is called notice to the applicant. Notice to the applicant. Testable point, notice to the applicant. There is a, a form that says, we are going to pull your credit. FYI, we are pulling your credit. We are pulling your credit. By the way, we are pulling your credit. Because with life and health and all insurance, actually, most states, some states will prevent it. But most states will allow insurance companies to pull credit to, to see how risky someone is. Because statistically speaking, and insurance is all about statistics and numbers, law of large numbers, hello. Um, but statistically speaking, people who have bad credit will file more claims. So you're just way more likely to file a claim if you have a, a bad credit score than someone who has a good credit score. So they pull your credit and they use it to determine your risk level and your um, premium. Why? Why what? Why? Because you're more likely to file claims. If you have bad credit and you have no money, you're going to file a claim. Well, yeah. I'm here to ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> He's a butthead. Anyway. <clears throat> um, okay. So they're going to pull your credit. So the notice to the applicant, we're going to pull your credit. We're going to pull your credit. We're going to pull your credit. You got to leave that with them before you leave. In fact, they say you, what must be left with the customer when you leave the sales presentation appointment, whatever, you must leave them a notice to the applicant, letting them know that you will be pulling your credit. Now you take that application as the insurance agent filled out in blue or black ink. If there's any changes, you either threw it away, started fresh, or you drew a line through the air and had the customer initial. Then you, oh, oh, sorry. One more thing on the application. You need signatures. So before you submit it to underwriting, you need signatures. You give them the notice and you get signatures. You, you need a minimum of two and sometimes you need three. The two signatures you need are the agent, which is you. So you will have to sign the application. Every application that you fill out, you will have to sign that application. And then you need the, the applicant and the insured. The applicant and the insured... The applicant can sometimes be the owner. I myself bought life insurance on myself. I am both the applicant and the owner. So I am the insured. I am the one whose life they are insuring so that if I die, it will pay out. And I am the owner of the policy, which means I'm the one who bought it. I'm the one who pays for it. And I'm the one who gets to decide who it pays out to, what happens to the proceeds after I die. So I am the applicant and the owner. If the if one person is both applicant and the owner, you need their signature and the agent's signature. You only need two. If you have a, an agent, an applicant, and an, an owner, you need three. So this is pretty common when you have, if you have a husband buy a policy on a wife or you have a wife buy a policy on a husband, you have the... And it's important. Why would you want to be, why, you know, why would you want to be the owner of your spouse's policy so you can make the decisions? If you own it, you get to decide who's the beneficiary. If someone else owns it, they get to decide who the beneficiary is. 
So if you want to make sure you're the beneficiary, if your spouse dies, be the owner. Own the policy so that you can be the one to decide how it will pay out. Um, if you're not the owner, you don't have those decisions, um, which kind of goes into revocable, irrevocable, but that's besides the point. We'll maybe talk about that later. So you need their signatures. So if you have a husband and a wife and the agent, you need three signatures, owner, applicant, and agent. Oh, I have a sneeze. Oh, it's not going to come out. Okay. Sorry. It's tickling. Stop looking at me like that. Okay. So you have the owner, the applicant, and the agent, or you have the owner, applicant, and agent. So you need two to three signatures. So you gather your signatures. You've given them the notice to the applicant and you tell them, I'm going to submit this to the company underwriter. We should have a decision in like two to three weeks. You may need to also, depending on what the, what the application is, you may be giving them instructions on doing a medical exam or who they need to meet with to get that done or whatever. But the main things that you need to remember are that you, you gave them the notice. One, that your sales presentation was accurate and complete. You filled out the application with blue or black ink. You made your corrections. The best way was either throwing it away. The other way is drawing a line through the air and have the customer initial. You got the signatures that you needed and you gave them the notice. Now you're going to take that paperwork and submit it to the company underwriter. Now the company underwriter does not talk to the customer. That was your job as a field underwriter. The company underwriter is a person who just loves paperwork. They want to look at the papers. They want to assess the risk. So as we talked about earlier, insurance is the transfer of risk. This young couple who owns a, a house with a 30-year mortgage and they have three children, they have the risk of one of them dying or both of them dying and still needing to be able to take care of their, ki their kids and pay off their mortgage. So the risk of one of them dying and, and not making any more money is being transferred to the insurance company. So the insurance gonna, company is going to say, well, how risky is this? Is this a healthy person? Is this an unhealthy person? Is this a young person? Is this an old person? Is this a person with bad credit? Is this a person with a lot of medical issues? Is this a person with dangerous hobbies? Do they like to jump out of airplanes? Are they a, a pilot? Are they very, uh, airplanes are just very dangerous in general, I guess. Um, and so the pilots can actually be excluded um, if you're a private pilot. Commercial pilots are fine. But anyway, they want to figure out how risky you are. So the company underwriter, the desk underwriter, is looking through all of these things to figure out how risky are you. And then depending on how risky are you will determine your premium. Now, there are multiple tiers. And when you actually get into selling insurance, you're going to find out that there's way more than what I just talked about. And that's fine. We are happy to know that there are only four things that you need to know on the insurance exam about how people can be rated. The fourth one, which I mean, isn't even, doesn't even technically count, is that they're declined. If a person is so risky, if they're like, bro, you're, uh -uh, you're going to die here very soon. We're barely going to collect a couple months premium before we're going to have to pay out on you. You're too much of a risk. We don't want you. They decline you. So if you're too risky, they can just outright say, no, we don't want you. Sorry. Goodbye. Not to decline. If you're not a decline, then you're going to be one of the three. The first one is known as preferred. Preferred are your super healthy people. This is your marathon runners, your kale eaters, your juice drinkers. These are the very healthy people. That's a preferred person. Then you have standard. Standard is I eat kale, but I also eat cake. I'm moderate. I'm standard. I'm average. That's standard. Then you have substandard. Substandard is I only eat cake. I'm unhealthy. I'm not very well, whatever, however it is you want to say it. That would be substandard. So those are the three main ones. You have preferred, standard, or substandard. And then, of course, you have declined, but they don't even really count that as one of the three. Now, here's what we need to understand about these three. First, standard is standard. It's not more. It's not less. It's standard. Everyone should expect to pay standard. Like 
And what I mean by that is, again, it's not more, it's not less, it just is. So they may ask a question that that talks about the difference between the premium of preferred and standard. Focus on preferred as being less than standard. Don't think standard is more than preferred. It is, but we don't word it that way. Standard is never more, never less. It is. It's standard. It's set in stone as standard. It's not more. It's not less. It's standard. Preferred is less than standard. So if you're preferred, if you're the kale eater, you're the marathon runner, super healthy, you would be preferred. And you will pay a lesser premium than someone who is standard. Then you have substandard. And like we said, substandard is the unhealthy cake only people. Um, and they're going to pay more than standard. So they're going to have what's called a rated up premium. That, that could be a testable point, rated up. They'll say, what kind of premium does a substandard person have? Rated up. So if it's rated up, it means the premium is higher than standard. So preferred is less than standard. Substandard is more than preferred. But standard is standard. It's not more or less. It just is. Now, I use cake and kale because those are little easy memory tricks that a preferred is kale eating, substandard is cake eating, and standard is cake and kale. I know that implies weight, but weight is just one factor. You could be a kale eating marathon running person who loves to jump out of airplanes. Now you're substandard. Because substandard isn't just about health. It could be about dangerous hobbies or habits as well. So if you if you just have a lot of dangerous hobbies or habits, then they can put you as substandard even if your body is very healthy because you have a dangerous hobby or habit. Okay, so the again, let's set the tone. Let's go back to where we were. Let's connect all the dots. You as an insurance agent make a phone call, you schedule an appointment, you go sit out in front of this family, you've got a, a young couple with three children, a 30-year mortgage, you need to protect them, you need to make sure that if one of them dies or becomes disabled, that the other one of them will have plenty of money to feed and take care of the children. You do a sales presentation, which has to be accurate and complete. You're explaining what's available to them with the coverages. They say, we want that one. You say, okay. You begin filling out the application under the agent's watchful eye in blue or black ink. If you make an error, you will either the best way, crumble it up, throw it away, start fresh, or the other way, draw a line through the error, have the customer initial. You will get their signatures at the bottom. You need the agent, the applicant, and the owner. Sometimes the owner and the applicant are the same. Sometimes they are not. You give them the notice to the applicant, which is that we are going to pull your credit notice. And then you take the application, you submit it to the company underwriter. The company underwriter analyzes the application and they may look at some other stuff like medical exams, credit report, um, MIB, APS, stuff like that. They use all, and we'll talk about those. They use all of those to determine how risky you are. The more risky, the higher premium less risky, the lower premium. If you're standard, you're paying the standard rate, not more, not less. If you are preferred, you're paying a lesser rate. You're going to pay the cheapest rate. And if you are substandard, you're going to be paying rated up premium. You're going to be paying a higher premium because you are more dangerous, uh, more risky, more likely to file a claim if you are substandard. And now the insurance company is going to take a couple of weeks to figure this out. Well, Old school anyway. Um, nowadays, again, we have computers and algorithms that would have beep, beep, beep. You can, you can give them a policy the same day, but old school, it definitely took a few weeks and it still can. It just depends. So you tell them it's going to take a couple of weeks when you submit this to the company underwriter. Now, when they come back, say preferred, standard, substandard, whatever, doesn't matter. They determine the premium. If they're going to issue, they say, yes, we will issue and we're going to give her a standard rate. We're going to issue, we're going to give her a preferred rate, whatever. Now, as the agent, it is your job to then take the policy that the company has said, okay, we will go ahead and issue this. Your job is now to deliver it to the customer. So you you take the policy, you're, you're kind of at the beginning and the end. It's really weird because you are a middleman. You're a middleman in between the customer and the insurance company. 
you're the middleman, but at the same time, you're also, you're weirdly like the, you're at the beginning of the transaction where you do the sales presentation. You're at the end of the transaction where you do the delivering of the policy and all the stuff in between was done by the company underwriter determining how risky the people are. You as an agent will not analyze someone's risk. You may write down their risk on the um, application and stuff, but it's not your job to decide if someone is insurable or not. Now there may be like, we never insure anybody over the age of 80. And you would say, sorry, I can't help you because you're over 80. But you didn't set those rules. Someone else did. It's not your job as an agent to decide who is coverable or not. If they if they fit one of the never cover rules, that's fine. But you're not the one who made that call. You're just simply applying it to them. So anyway, um, you go to deliver the policy to them. Now, this is called policy delivery. And it's important that um, they, they love to stress that personal delivery is best. Now mailing it is fine. And that is a test question that I've seen many times. Pamela got really mad that you mailed the policy to her instead of delivered it to her. What's going to happen now? And the answer is like nothing. The policy is fine. Just because she, she wanted it in person doesn't matter. We still mailed it to her. It's fine. Um, so there's no rule that says you must do it in person but they do say that personal delivery is best. And the reason they want you to do it in person is because if there was any changes between the filling out of the application and the insurance company issuing a policy, the policy review delivery is a perfect time to go over that. Like maybe for instance, the, the person said, yeah, I'm healthy, 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 healthy. I don't have any issues. And then we get back a medical exam that says, oh, they've got this little thing. Like, oh, I didn't know. Thanks for letting me know. It may change the premium or it may like, or maybe they wanted a, a certain coverage, but because of the results of their medical exam, they can't get it. So during the personal review, during the policy delivery, it's your time to be able to explain to them if there's any changes um, from what they applied for and what they are. And then just kind of giving them a review of the policy and letting them know this is how you're covered. This is the policy that we set up. You know, you can look here for help, look here, whatever. You're explaining the policy to them. And they say that, again, personal delivery is best, but it's it's not a requirement. Mailing it is just fine. Um, now, what are some of the things that they look at? What are some of the things that the uh, company underwriter will look at? Is they will look at, like we said, the application, which is the main source of underwriting. The application is the main source of underwriting. Testable point. They will also look at other things um, Two, There's two versions of like a medical exam. Um, there's a medical exam, which is basically blood and urine. How healthy are you today? What does your blood and urine say about you today? Then there is an APS. An APS is known as an attending physician's statement. This is basically the doctor that you go to for everything, your primary care physician, whatever. They know everything about you. Your doctor will send a fax to them, basically asking, tell us everything about them. And the doctor will give them all your important history, whatever's. And that's an APS. They generally will do an APS, attending physician statement for someone who has deeper medical issues. Um, if they have like a, a medical past, like for me personally, I had um, papillary thyroid cancer. And if I answered, yes, I had cancer, they're going to want to, they're going to want to dig further. They're going to want to get an APS to find out my diagnoses, my prognoses, my chance of, um, what is it called when it comes back? My chance of reoccurrence, whatever, or my, um, survival rate, whatever. They're going to want to know those things. So they do an APS when you have a deeper, um, medical issue. Um, however, with COVID, it kind of got weird. They stopped doing blood and urine because they didn't want people next to each other. And they started doing APSs for everybody. I'm not sure if we've shifted back yet, but that's not even matters on the exam. That's just a little brain tangent. So the company underwriter is looking at either a medical exam, which is basically blood and urine. The thing you want to know for the uh, state exam is that a medical exam has to be done by an actual medical person. Um, I forget the word they use. It kind of is like EMT. What is it? I don't know. It, they've got to they've got to have a medical thing. They can't just be some random person collecting your urine. They've got to have some sort of medical credentialing. Para, paramedic, paramedic, para, para something. I think they use the word para. 
paramedical para I don't know. <laughs> What'd you say? Should I go get my book? <laughs> no, you don't need to get your book. Para paraprofessional? I don't know. It won't explain it better, better than you. No, it won't. Uh <laughs> So anyway, you get your um, your medical exam, um, or you could do the APS. The APS is a deep dive of their medical history. That's what they're going to ask you the difference of. The medical exam um, is just your current state of health. What does your blood and urine say about you today? Your APS is a deep dive of your medical history. And the other big thing to know about either of those, if the insurance company wants you to do either one of those, they will pay, they will pay for it. So applying for life and health insurance, applying for any insurance should be free. You should never have to pay to put in an application for insurance. So if you're putting in an application for life and health and they want you to get an APS or they ask your doctor to fill out the APS or they want you to get a medical exam, the insurance company themselves will be the one to pay for the exam. And that is definitely a testable point that the insurance company themselves needs to pay for either the APS or the medical exam or both if they have you do both, whatever. The point is the customer will never pay for any of these exams. Now, not every state will ask this, but it's in enough states for me to mention it, HIV testing. First, they're not allowed to HIV test based on what you might think. They're only allowed to HIV test if they've already decided in advance that they're going to HIV test. What I mean for that is when you learn the concept called law of large numbers, and this is in the general insurance chapter, insurance is all about the law of large numbers. Basically, insurance is a formal gambling system. <laughs> and they 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 do all of the they run all of the numbers and all of the statistics and all of the probabilities to find out what are the chances of someone actually crashing their car, actually dying, actually getting sick, whatever. And they have this down to a science, which is why insurance companies make bajillions and millions of dollars. United Healthcare covers what? Medical insurance, which we all complain is the most expensive thing. Guess who's making all the money? United Healthcare makes billions. But anyway, they figured it out. They figured out how to make a gambling system, a bingo system <laughs> that works for everyone. I'm good. I got my I got my little jacket. He's trying to give me a blanket. He got me a blanket for the truck because it's so cold and windy. We got to roll all the windows down. <laughs> anyway, he's just so cute. Um, oh, you're gonna stare at me now? Thanks. <laughs> he moved. He moved positions to be right here. Anyway, what was I? You are used to watching. No, you should watch on your phone. Get on no. your phone. I am. It's it's planned. It's not the same when I got it live. <laughs> anyway, what, um, for? what was I talking about? Sorry, Scratching. <laughs> dying. Scratching this... or dying? Oh, oh yeah. insurance statistics. companies figured out the statistics. They know the statistics. So the law of large numbers. The law of large numbers says that they're going to put you in a group and they're going to look at your group and they assess what that group does. And so basically when you answer your, your questions on the application, however it is that you answer, you're, you, there are going to be people who answer just like you. And you guys get put into a group called a homogeneous or a class. And that's all part of the law of large numbers. And I know that I was talking about this for some reason, because we're talking about the premium and the, why was I talking about the law of large numbers? Statistics, probability. Why you got me distracted? I can't even rewind. <sighs> Law of large numbers. Class, homogeneous. You filled out the paperwork and they put you in a category. Yes. Uh-huh. I remember that part. But it goes further than that. <laughs> there was a reason. Does anybody remember? Um, Sorry. HIV, thank you. Okay, HIV. With the HIV, if they're, what they do is they say, if you're in this class, we will HIV test you, but only if you, if you're in this class. So basically with, when, with the HIV, they don't HIV test you because you tell them your sexual orientation, which I think most people probably think, oh, well, if a person says that they're gay, that they're homosexual, 
that the insurance will test them for HIV. I get it. That's what a lot of people will think. That is not what insurance companies are allowed to do. In fact, they can't even ask you what your sexual orientation is, nor do they even give a flip. They don't even care about trans. Like it doesn't bother them. It's like whatever. But anyway, um, they don't HIV test random people based on the answers they decide in advance that if you end up being part of this class, if you end up being part of this homogeneous, everyone in this class, everyone in this homogeneous will have to take an HIV test. And generally, it's actually for people who are asking for millions of dollars. So if you're asking for a lot of money, then they do an HIV test, but they don't HIV test everyone. And they have to decide in advance which classes will be HIV tested. They can't just randomly say, oh, this applicant says that they're gay, so we're going to HIV test them. That doesn't happen like that. Because being gay is not one of the things that they can even look at or judge you on. So with HIV testing, one, you want to know that they can't, that, that they have to have set in place who it is that they're going to test. They don't just test random people. The other thing you want to know about HIV testing is that, um, well, there's two things, and now both of them are trying to fight me in my head. Um, they cannot test you without your permission. So in order for them to test you for HIV, they must have your written consent that says, yes, I am allowing you to test my blood for HIV. The other thing is that they cannot judge you on symptoms alone. So they can't say, oh, well, she has the symptoms of HIV, so we're going to give her an HIV rate. They cannot do that. There has to be an official diagnosis of HIV in order for them to then charge me an HIV rate. And the other last thing with HIV is that the insurance company has to keep it, keep that information protected, that the results of the HIV test cannot just be shared with anybody, that even you as an agent will not receive the report if someone is or is positive. Um, only the company underwriter, only select people will be able to see the results of the um, HIV test. Yes, which is also part of HIPAA law. Other than large money, how did they determine they will test? That tends to be the one thing. Because again, they, like I said, they cannot test people based on sexual orientation, which is generally something that people immediately associate HIV as being um, gay, uh, what is the other word? Heter uh, heterosexual. Homosexual. No, homo. Homosexual. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is too many words. Too many. Uh, yeah, insurance companies don't care about none of that. Um, so that's with the HIV testing. We so we talked about the medical exam. We talked about APS. Um, the, the big thing about APS is it's a deep dive of the medical history. HIV testing, they're not allowed to do it unless they've already decided in advance which classes they're gonna do. They can't test you without your permission, they can't share your information, and they have to keep the information protected. Um, what else do we have? We also have the MIB. Now, the MIB, not quite the men in black, but it sounds a little bit like the men in black, like a secret society in a way. So insurance companies are certainly competitors, but they're also very much friends. Like there's plenty of space for McDonald's to exist right next to Burger King. There's plenty of space for all states, State Farm, Progressive, and Geico to be in the business. They're not really competing with one another. They all got plenty of business, okay? So they're going to be friends with each other as, as just as much as their competitors. One of the ways that they're friendly with each other is by keeping tabs on people who lie, keeping tabs on people who file a bunch of claims. Because if you go to like Allstate, you file claim after claim after claim, you go to State Farm and if they don't know the history of you at Allstate, they're going to think that, you know, you don't have a lot of risk. But trust me, all that stuff is kept track of. Every claim you file, every insurance policy you have, there is a system out there and they all know who you're insured with. I called Geico for a quote or something. I'm like covered with progressive. I called Geico and he's like, well, what about this car? What about this car? I'm like, how do you know I own all those cars? <laughs> like they know everything. Um, so anyway, oh, oh, I didn't know HIPAA law still exists the way they ignore it with COVID. <laughs> Oh, that, yeah. That is true. How do you know if I'm vaccinated? It's silly, but <clears throat> they're a little, yeah, that is my boss. One day he's like, he's like, there's going to be like temperature sensors. Like, do you have a fever when you're walking into a place? And if it beeps, you got to be kicked out. Yeah, like, we, we actually had 
Yes, it's gonna get crazy. Oh, At least oh, it's kind of going away. COVID yeah. is dying. So, I mean, we had that. Is it dying yet? I don't know. I don't pay attention anymore. COVID's here to stay, just like any other disease. So anyway, sorry. No problem. Um, what else? Uh, the MIB. Okay, so the MIB Men in Black Insurance Companies are friends. What the MIB is is it is a membership organization. So the MIB is a nonprofit membership organization. The members are insurance companies. So all of them started a company together. That's a nonprofit organization called the MIB Medical Information Bureau. Kind of a kind of a misleading name, just like the Federal Reserve is not really the Federal Reserve. <laughs> but if you, the MIB is um, Medical Information Bureau. What it is, is it's all the insurance companies come together and they're friendly with one another and they basically share information. And what they're sharing is previous applications that you've submitted to insurance companies. So let's say I fill out an application with Allstate. And like I said, I have my history and I'm looking for life insurance. So, and I have my history of, of thyroid cancer. So I put that on my application that I have a history of thyroid cancer. And let's say for what, and this is not true. This is just all examples, whatever. Let's say Allstate has a no cancer policy. They will not insure anyone for life insurance who has ever had cancer. Just no. So they decline me telling me that's because of my cancer history. So then let's say I go to another company. Let's say, let's say I go to State Farm. And um, when I get to the, and I know that the reason Allstate declined me was because of my cancer. So I'm like, you know what? When I fill out this application with State Farm, I'm not going to tell them. It happened when I was, when I was, yes, the MIB, he wrote, he wrote it out for me. Medical Information Bureau, MIB. <laughs> so sweet. <laughs> so let's say when I get to the question on State Farm's application about, <laughs> about do I have cancer or not, I might put in there no because I'm nervous. I don't want them to, to, to nix me again. I'll be like, oh, well, it happened when I was 16. I was so young. I'm going to pretend that I forgot about it. Like, whatever. Oh, I thought you meant when I was after 18. You know, like, make it up. but. Definitely not put that I had cancer on there. So my State Farm application says, no, I never had cancer. Now, State Farm is going to go to the MIB, just like they all do, because they all it's all a nonprofit membership-owned organization that all the insurers basically, you know, put into. State Farm is going to go to the MIB. They're going to say, hey, we just got this application from Melissa. She's looking for life insurance. Do you have any other application that she's submitted? And they're going to go, actually, she submitted an application with Allstate two weeks ago. Here's a copy of it. So, so Allstate is taking every application that they receive and giving it to the Medical Information Bureau. State Farm is taking every application they've ever received, giving it to the MIB. And I don't even know if they're part of it, but most of them are. My point is that insurance companies take the applications that they receive from people, submit them to the MIB. So that the next insurance company who's getting an application can compare it to every other application I've ever filled out. So State Farm comes in with my new application that I just did with them. They compare it to my Allstate application to see if I said the same things, to see if I lied, to see if I'm saying anything different. So they're going to go line by line, Melissa, Melissa, 35, 35, like they're comparing, everything's the same. Oh, wait a minute. With Allstate, she told them she did have cancer. With us, she didn't. Something's not right here. So they catch me in a lie. So the MIB is a way for insurance companies to share applications with one another. And they're gonna, they might use the phrase coded medical information. They share these applications with other people, with other insurance companies, so that we could catch people in a lie. Because it because if even though you know, like insurance companies are competitors. At the same time, they need proper data. And if they don't have the right data, they can't make the right law of large numbers work. And there needs to be plenty of money to pay the claims. And if people are lying and end up filing more claims than what their data says, that's not going to work very well for insurance companies. They must have proper data. So by sharing these applications amongst each other, they're helping to maintain that they have the correct data and that they're, they're charging the accurate premium. The more that they can catch people lying, the better it is for everybody because then we're not overpaying premium. If they have the bad data, 
<clears throat> and they're not collecting enough money, they'll just jack up the rate until they make enough money. So by having the, the correct data, they're only charging us, you know, the actual premium that we truly need to pay. So anyway, <clears throat> the MIB Medical Information Bureau stores coded medical information, allows the insurers to see if anyone is lying. Now, what you really need to know about the um, MIB is that an insurance company is not allowed to decline you just because of what they found in the MIB. So they can't say, oh, Melissa, you lied. You put in a wrong answer. Get out of here. They'll just slide the application back to me and say, can you correct this? Now, I have seen in the real world that if you give wrong information that doesn't match the MIB, you could, they can. I don't know how it works, but I've seen them like, they don't like, they don't like when you lie to them. They really, really don't. Um, so if they catch you, the testable point is that they cannot decline you because of what they found in the MIB. And that might make you think that you're protected, but you're not because in the real world, however they do it, I don't know. I haven't sold a lot of life and health myself to know, but you don't want to lie to them or the MIB. It could even just mean a higher premium that if they find information in the MIB that you didn't tell them, they can just charge you a higher premium for that because you're a little liar pants and that makes you risky. So they can charge you a higher premium, but they can't decline you just because of what they found. That is a testable point. So the big testable points for the MIB is nonprofit membership owned organization stores coded medical information, cannot use this information to decline a person. Okay. Those are the big main things about the MIB. Then you have consumer reports. So again, we're talking about all the things that an insurance company, a company underwriter will look at to assess your risk. So they're looking at the application, the main source of underwriting. They're looking at potentially a medical exam done by a paramedical professional, blood and urine, looking at an APS, an attending physician statement, a deep dive of your medical history. Either one of those, the insurance company has to pay for, the, the applicant themselves will not pay for that. They can look at the MIB, the Medical Information Bureau, comparing any past insurance applications with your current application to see if everything matchy matchy. Um, and then they can also look at your credit report or they're going to call it consumer report. And this is what that notice to the applicant is. You give a notice to the applicant that you're going to be pulling their credit and the consumer report is pulling the credit. Now, technically speaking, there is, um, all reports are consumer reports. So now consumer reports are like public sources, um, credit report, job history, stuff like that. But inside of consumer report, there is a special type called investigative, investigative. So like every, every, there we go. Every report is a consumer report. And then there's a special type called investigative. What makes investigative unique is that it requires an interview, investigative interview, investigative interview, investigative interview. A investigative consumer re report requires that they interview your friends and family. Now, again, this is not done for everybody. They're not, every single person who files for life insurance, they're not going to start interviewing your friends and family. <laughs> this is only done for people who are, again, who are asking for millions. They only usually do the difficult stuff with people who are asking for a lot of money. And, um, the thing with the investigative, so you want to remember investigative interview, investigative interview, investigative interview. And if they're going to do an investigative interview, they have to tell you about it three days before they do it. So if they say, we want to do an investigative consumer report, that's the full phrase of it, investigative consumer report. They have to tell you three days before they do it. And then after they do it, if you say, I want to know what's in the report, they have five days to tell you, uh, show you. So I like say three to tell, five to show for investigative consumer report. I have three days to tell you I'm going to do it. I have five days to show you the results if you want to see them. So three to tell, five to show investigative consumer reports. And again, interview. Investigative interview, investigative interview, investigative interview. In fact, what's really weird is they will, they kind of um, define both a consumer report and investigative consumer report with the same um, definition that they're looking at a person's reputation and habits and lifestyle. 
Both of them say that, but the, the, the one key difference is interview. That investigative, they have to interview your friends and family to get that information. They can't just pull it from a, a, a public source. Um, so yeah, that's an investigative report. MIB, medical exam, APS. Those are all the main ones. Um, there may be a couple of other ones. No, um, stay safe. Um, those are um, federal. Um, three to five, three to tell, five to show is a federal thing. So that is not state specific, meaning that all of you should remember those numbers. Um, those numbers don't change. So investigative consumer report is three to tell, five to show all across the board, no matter what state you're in. Oh my gosh. Yes. I I'm from Nevada. I, I lived in Nevada too. I had to take the Nevada exam. It is 80%. Um, so you're not allowed to miss a lot of points. Um, so yeah, definitely make sure you get my, uh, all access packages so that you can get as much video content to help you understand the material, watch my YouTube videos all the time, whatever. Um, okay. So those are the main things that the company underwriter is looking at. And that's what will determine if your preferred standard or substandard, and then, you know, deliver the policy. So let's do a recap of everything. And by the way, make sure you're asking any questions. If you have any questions, make sure to put them in the, the chat box. We're down to about the last 15 minutes. I know we haven't talked about a lot of things. I just was going to come on and start talking. Um, but if you have any questions, make sure you ask right now. You have me live right now. Ask, ask, ask. Um, so as a recap, you have a sales presentation. You go to the customer's house. You're sitting at their kitchen table. You're presenting them with what's available to sale. Uh, what's available for them to buy. The sales presentation has to be accurate and complete. Then you begin filling out the application with them under the agent's watchful eye in blue or black ink. Any changes, the best way is to crumple it up, throw it away, start fresh. The other way, draw a line through the error, have the customer initial um, the change. Never the agent makes the initial. It always is the customer or the applicant. Then you get the signatures at the bottom. You as the agent needs to sign. The applicant, the person whose life we are insuring needs to sign. And then the owner of the policy needs to sign. Sometimes the applicant and the owner are the same person. Then you submit that to the company underwriter, who is the one who is assessing this person and all of their risks. They're going to look at the application, which is known as the main source of underwriting. But they can also look at your medical exams done by a paramedical professional. They can look at an APS, an attending physician statement, which is a deep dive of your medical history. They can look at HIV, which they're not allowed to do unless they have your written consent. Um, they can look at the MIB, the Medical Information Bureau, that nonprofit member organization owned by insurance companies to potentially catch you in a lie. Um, and then they can look at your consumer report, your credit report, and also an investigative consumer report. And if they do the investigative, they have three days to tell you, five days to show you. And from all of that information, they will decide if you are preferred, standard, substandard, or declined. Declined says, sorry, we can't help you at all. Preferred says you're super healthy. You'll pay the cheapest premium. Standard says you're average. You're going to pay the standard premium. And um, substandard is you're super risky. And they are you're going to have a higher rated up um, premium. You need me to do that right now? No. I'm in that section. <laughs> I mean, there's only like 10 minutes left. Don't you go until nine? No, today is six to eight, Thursday, six to nine. Oh, the sorry. paid for class is the three hours. Sorry. That's okay, babe. I appreciate you being involved up in my business. Well, that's what you got me here for to keep you on track. <laughs> you distracted me. Okay. So that's basically completing the app, life basics or health basics or field underwriting. So that chapter is on everybody, whether you're Pearson or Prometric. That chapter, everybody needs to know that. This is coming from completing the application, field underwriting, life basics, or health basics, depending on if you're Pearson or Prometric. And this, th so everything, I'm actually going to retitle this video as completing the application, since that's pretty much what we talked about. Um, and then we also kind of talked about like how to study, what to, you know, like what is the major focus. Again, life insurance, the major focus is going to be term and whole, as well as life provisions. And then health insurance, the main focus will be um, HMO versus PPO, disability, and health provisions. And then everybody needs, you know, state law. Um, and I have, I posted the links below. 
um, for what, what is available of mine to purchase that teaches those things to help you. People have said that repeatedly rewatching my stuff is what helps them to secure a pass because again, you don't need to know it all. You just need to know the things they're actually going to ask you on. And those are the things I focus on in my teaching so that you don't have to remember a bunch of stuff. You just remember what you need and you go into pass. We also talked about how this exam is difficult for people that there, while there may be a couple of people who could study in a weekend and pass the exam, that's not the majority. People yet generally need to take this exam minimum three times before they pass. The national average is 50% pass the first time, meaning half the people will fail. And again, most people need to take it at least three times. Now, with that in mind, one of the reasons that it takes so many times is because they give you false information about how to study. Doing practice exams is not the way to study. You want to actually know and understand the information, which is what I focus on with my class recordings and anything that I teach on. I try to make it so that you can actually understand and apply the information and see how it works in your life, like sitting at a kitchen table with the customer, talking about real world examples of them needing to protect their house, pay off their mortgage. Thank you, Kay Cross. I appreciate it. $4.99. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, this is a free class and I'm relying just on you guys' um, donating, saying super thanks, super likes. There's some way to do that in the YouTube system. Three of you have figured it out. Thank you. <laughs> I think there's like a little dollar sign um, under your chat box area. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and so with the, with studying, it's very, very important that you have a positive mindset. Okay. So one, so many people feel crushed and destroyed when they fail this exam, especially, and I think, I think not only do we just have a mindset problem coming from school as a former teacher, I know that I, that I made kids feel bad when they didn't succeed. And that is one of the reasons why I had to leave teaching because it's the system built. You either get A's or you're horrible. And I, and I hated that system. And we also, you know, we're not allowed to, to show our work until it's perfect. And I just, so many of us have a lot of messed up beliefs about work and schoolwork and studying. And if I'm smart enough or whatever, and all of those can really bog you down when you're trying to study this material. Keep in mind, you're learning a brand new language here. Insurance is a whole new language and you, you don't know any, you know, you're learning all of it. So you're learning a whole new language, a whole new way of talking. It's loaded with insurance jargon and you could potentially have, you know, test anxiety. So give yourself some grace, like don't put pressure on yourself to pass the first time and certainly don't beat yourself up if you don't pass the first time because most people don't. Okay. Okay. But, 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 but the best way to help yourself to be able to pass the first time and, or to keep your stamina going without like being so frustrated is to just go in with a positive mindset. So I have two YouTube, um, audios that you can listen to. One is studying motivation. This is one that you listen to while you're studying and it just helps to put you in a good mindset, a good space so that you feel good as you study. If you go into study saying, I hate this, I'm not going to be able to learn this information. This is too hard. This is too difficult. You're setting yourself up for failure every time. There's this thing in teaching called self-fulfilling prophecy. And it's true. It's legitimate. It works every time. If a teacher is told that a child is dumb, the teacher will treat the child as if they are dumb and they will continue to be dumb. If a teacher is told that this child is smart and gifted, the teacher will treat the child as if they are smart and gifted, and the child will continue to be more smart and gifted. Self-fulfilling prophecy. What you tell yourself is true will be true. So if you tell yourself, this is too hard, this is too difficult, I'm too dumb, I can't do this, you are building yourself up to fail. You are crushing yourself, destroying yourself if you have a negative mindset going in about studying and testing in general. So you got to get a positive mindset. So before every day of study, listen to the study motivation um, audio. It's like five minutes and it just gives you, it just cheers you up, gets you excited about studying and helps your mind be open and ready to absorb the information without being blocked out by negative, my, this sucks and it's too hard thoughts. The next audio that I have is the um, about to test mindset, uh, meditation, whatever you want to call it, audio meditation. And this one is that you listen to right before you take the exam. 
So you just listen to the audio a couple of times before you head into the exam. It gives you, again, that positive mindset, that good energy so that you can go in and feel better. If you go in feeling bad, you're going to walk out feeling bad. You go in feeling good, you're going to walk out feeling good. It's kind of that simple. Um, and again, even if you fail, because I even say this in the about to test um you know, audio, I say, we, we, we go in saying we're going to pass. I'm going to pass. I got this pass. I'm definitely going to pass. I'm going to pass. Right. I definitely want you to have that vibe, but I also don't want you to be deflated like a little balloon when you see a fail because it's normal to fail. They don't make this easy on you. Give yourself some grace. Probably you haven't been in school in so long. And this is like a college level course that they want you to do in like two days. Give yourself some grace. It's okay. So part of the meditation audio is I say, if you fail, just go back and do it again because no problem. No problem. I'll just go back and do it again. If this were your driving exam, you wouldn't give up. I know plenty of people who struggled to drive, my sister being one of them because my dad forced her to drive on a stick shift and she just could not. And you just keep going though. Nobody, like, I don't know. I hardly know anybody who's like, oh, I, I failed my driver's test three times and I gave up. I'm never going to drive. No, you do it. So have that same energy, that same, like, I'm going to get this done. There is no other choice and option with the insurance exam. And again, if you're going into it positive and excited, you're going to have better results um, than if you, you know, go in negative and sad and upset and worried and fearful. None of those are feeding, you know, a good result. Those are just feeding a sad crappy result. So you want to come in feeling good. You want to feel good studying. You want to feel good testing. You want to feel good, all these things. And big thing, which I always stress, don't take practice exam after practice exam after practice exam. Stop, 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 stop with all the testing. My, I talked about her earlier in Wisconsin where she, um, she was my first uh, Royal Truman client. She passed with a 71% after struggling for an entire year. She then found me we worked together for less than a month, passed her exam with a 71%. Um, she took one practice exam. That's it. One. I think two, like she had to, she had to take two. One for like simulate, one for certificate, something like that. But she only took each one one time. One time. How many of you have taken it 20 times? There's a lot of people. I, I Working for the corporate company, there was one woman who spent 140 hours testing. I could see it. I could see how many hours she took her test, how many attempts she took her test. And it blew my mind. I'm like, you have spent three weeks of work just testing, just doing A, B, C, D. Well, when I, when I went to took my last testing in person view, I made a lady that took, she had taken her PC six different times and her life and health 12 different times. Yeah. I'm like, that's crazy. I don't want this. I'm glad I got Melissa. Yeah. You don't need to take it 12 times if you got me. Um, yeah. So it, yes, don't, don't do, no, you're fine. Don't do practice tests after practice tests. It is not, it is not an effective method and it can't, it's, it's like that joke on, um, Anchorman, like the, the cologne works 60%, it works 60% of the time, hundred percent of the time. Like that's how I feel about practice testing that, there are some people who could take the practice test over and over again. They understand how tests work. They, there, there are people, I'm one of them. I could take a test and most likely pass it on any given topic just because I understand how tests work. Some people are like that. Not everyone is like that. And that's okay. You don't need to understand how tests work. Um, it, sometimes it's just natural. My, my dad gave us an IQ test. I got the highest score. And I'm like, I'm the dumbest of us all. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand how that happens. And it's, I'm a really, really, really good test taker. I just naturally do well on tests, no matter what the test is. Some people are like that. And those are the people who can do practice tests, practice tests, practice tests, and pass the state. But many of you will do practice tests, practice tests, get an 80, get an 80, get an 80. Oh my God, I'm definitely going to pass. I'm feeling so good. Go into the testing center. I don't know that. I don't know that. I don't know that. I don't know that. Oh, I don't know that. Oh my God, I failed. That's why it's so disappointing for so many people is because they study, they do these practice exams, receive a really high score on these practice exams, and then go to take the actual state and they bomb it. And they go, shit, I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing. I don't know anything. 
What did I do all the studying for? That's why I don't, do not advocate practice testing. At some point, I will make my own exam for people to help out, but I avoid it like the plague because I don't want people to focus only on practice exams. You, you got to know and understand the material. And, and again, you only need to know and understand the material they actually test you on, which is what I focus on. Um, I'm not a state approved course, so I don't have to give you all the possible things that state approved courses like Excel have to do. Do you work NV80 score? I don't know what you, how do, how does it test? You just have to score an 80%. So in Nevada, so every other state is pretty much 70%. You got to pass with this. California is 60 and they still fail. There's so many people who Shit, I'm failing. Some first time though then. I know. Oh. I don't know if the California exam is extra hard, but a lot of people fail it still, really? even though it's only a 60%. Oh. Maybe it's because the way they, they break their, their exam down. But Nevada just requires an 80%. So I think that's what you're referring to. In Nevada, you have to have an 80% in really? order to pass. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and you know, it's funny is they don't actually tell you your score. They just tell you pass. Yes. Illinois too. Yeah. They don't I, tell you your score either. Some states will tell you, some will not. I get mad. I, I want to know. I was so mad. I passed the, so keep, I'm already licensed. I'm already whatever. I only took the, the Colorado exam because I was teaching in Colorado a lot. And I was like, I want to take the actual exam in Colorado to make sure that my teaching is in alignment with it. And he gave me a score and it said pass. And I'm like, oh. and he's like, I have never seen someone upset with a pass. <laughs> I was like, I pass every one of these. I was like, I want to know my actual score. Did I get a 90 or a 99? Like, I want to know. Well, you got a 71. Probably. <laughs> I did. I did get a 71 on my Arizona Life and Health. I had taken it two years before. And I was like, I remember enough of it. I'm just going to go in and wing it. I got a 70. I was sweating. Sweating. And that was years ago before I taught it again. Okay. How much for the life and health course? Okay, so I'm not, okay, so let me clarify. I myself am not a state approved course. You're gonna need one like Excel, Kaplan, 80 Bank. I'm not even, um, <laughs> um, exam FX, whatever, whatever course you already have. The reason many of you, you don't even get to pick. Somebody else picked for you. The employer, the company you're working for, they picked your course for you. You can't, whatever. Whatever state approved course you have, whatever, use that course. I complement whatever course you do have. So whether you have Excel or Kaplan or whatever, my videos will make those courses make sense. And my videos will highlight specifically what is important on the exam and what is not. So if you're asking me, Susan, how much my life and health all access passes, it's 111. And you can get that on my um, website. But if you were to buy Excel with the um, coupon code Queen, you would get um, where's my? You would get ten dollars off, and you would get uh, within twenty four to forty eight hours a link to my all access pass. So that way you're paying for one course and getting your state approved course and my videos in one. If you buy Excel. And use the coupon code Queen. If you already have a course like Excel or Kaplan or ExamFX or whatever, that's fine. Just get my videos now. Which, if you were to get all of them together, it's 111. Um, if you're doing Just Life, it's 77. Just Health, it's 77, I believe. I'm pasting the link now to my um, to my website where you can buy everything. So if you want to buy any previous class recordings, that's that's where you would go to get them. Um, also, this week, I am offering one-on-ones tomorrow. So I had I, I rarely offer one-on-ones because it's just, it, it could, yeah, it's just difficult to, to spend a lot of time in my business when I'm meeting one-on-ones with people. But I had enough people ask that I opened up my calendar for tomorrow. So there is an opportunity to book with me, to, to talk with me for one hour, whether you're, you're at the beginning, you're in the middle, you're at the end, you're trying to secure that next time pass. And it's just, it's been a struggle for you and you can't seem to make it happen. And you want to be able to talk with me to get yourself in the right zone, to know what it is you need to do to get that secure pass the next time. Um, the second link that I just posted, you can um, book. It's just for tomorrow, literally only for tomorrow. 
Um, as of right now, it, my calendar may be open up later, but we got a lot of stuff going on. He's got a surgery going on. We got stuff. We got to be traveling. So, um, I just opened it up for tomorrow. So, um, I don't see any other questions that I haven't answered. So if there's any other final things, let me know now. Otherwise we'll be ending the stream here and make sure you, you care. I say something? You can say something. Don't be, you can't use a lot of curse I, I words. Have, no, I'm not trying to. I know. I, I got to work on that too. <laughs> I have been trying to get you to do the test quiz, like answers only because when I, when you, when you're doing this and I know you, you know this, but when I was doing this, the thing is, is you don't know what to ask in the beginning because you don't know what you're learning. Yeah. You don't know how to ask. And by, by the time you go and take the test, you're like, my goodness, how? How do you ask this? How do you get through? And then you're like, uh, sweating bullets. Everything goes, Bleh. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's seriously though, when you get in front of that test, like you said, people, there's people that can take it, but the majority of people, yeah. they just like me brain fart. It's like, uh, yeah. Where did it all go? Yeah. I passed the exam or what I had. Now I did ABRC. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. I don't yeah. know with in Illinois. They ran through in two days my PNC and state. That's three different things in two days. Mm -hmm. And that also with life, health, and state. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, granted, my, most of the state is pretty much the same for PNC and life and health. Yeah. So it's pretty much the same. So I, when I went and did my life and health, I did a lot better. So, but the testing is, I mean, some of the questions you can't always ask all of them. Yeah, you don't know what you easier. don't know. And, and it's easier, though, after the questions are put out there to to ask questions. Yeah. You know, that, and I'm trying, guys. He is. He's like, write questions. <laughs> Sit down. Make me some questions. Yes. Um, and in fact, I've actually flirted around with this idea before. Um, stay safe. I'm going to be doing I have a PNC class on Thursday. So you have to buy a ticket for that one. Um, uh, let me give you the link for that one. Um, hi, Josh. My buddy there in Illinois, he, I got him to watch. <laughs> <laughs> watch my girlfriend. She's gone live. Okay. He's here for me. <laughs> I got one. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, so I just posted the link for the property and casualty. By the way, don't be like this guy. He did... What did you do? He took his property <laughs> test, failed it, took his casualty test, failed it, took his life test, failed it, took his health test, and failed it. Oh, no. I took all four tests in one day. PNC. The same states, day? Yes. State and state. All in the same day because I was told that's the best way to do it. Do your study test. Do it everything. And I'm like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. She is right. Don't do it all at the same time. Take your PNC. Take your state. If you want to do them together, it's not probably that big of a deal. But don't do all four. In one day. I can do all I four did, in one day. And I failed. I'll pa I can do I all four 60s. in one day. I got 60s. I did my New York property casualty, New York life and health in one day. And I and, passed with 90s. Well, it's good for you. You're just special. I'm just a teacher. Mm. Anyway, <clears throat> if you are going to do all four exams, though, um, do... It, it depends on what you want. If you want to do the hardest thing, get it out of the way. Do property casualty first. If you want to do the easiest thing, build up your confidence, do life and health first. So it just depends on what you're doing, but try to take and pass property casualty first before doing life and health or do life and health first before doing property casualty. Don't try to crisscross. That's one of the reasons why I called him. I don't really call people. If you message me, I'll message you. If you email me, I'll email you. If you leave a comment, I'll comment back. But if you ask me to call you, I'm going to say no, unless you ask Unless I mean, you ask I had twice, to explain my situation because they had it really confused. I, I was confused to no end. I mean, I was. I, I, I was in two weeks. I, I had everything. I mean, everything was booked within a month. That was crazy. And so yeah, I had to study this within two weeks, which should be enough time. But I just. But yeah, his his things are. He was asking me about life and health while sending me his property and casualty results, and I'm like, what is going on? So I did finally call him, and two hours later, here we are. You, I was actually calling for, you know, help and you fell in love with my voice. <laughs> it's so lovely. I know. I had to grade that. Anyway, um, I love you all. Um, 
Oh, your connection is unstable. All right. Well, I'm going to end the connection anyway. Sending you all the loves, all the vibes to pass your exam. Your Josh friend is making fun of you. And um, <laughs> leave a comment below if you if you have any questions or need any support. Make sure you're inside the Facebook group, Insurance Exam Queen um, Study Group for Newbies. And my my email is Insurance Exam Queen at Gmail. Insurance exam queen at gmail.com. Although one of the faster ways to get me is um, Telegram or Voxer because email requires that I sit down at my computer and then I go in and answer them. But if you Voxer me or Telegram me, all it requires is me picking up my phone and responding to you. <laughs> so either on Telegram or Voxer, I'm insurance exam queen on both. They're apps that you can download on your phone. Um, even Facebook Messenger, uh, Melissa Dillon is my... Um, profile, it's easier for me just to respond to you that way than, and then it is for email. Cause emails again, require me to sit on my computer and dedicate time to doing that. If I'm on my phone, I'm already on my phone. So telegram or Voxer insurance exam queen on both. Um, I got a ticket for Thursday. Am I supposed to download the app? No, you, uh, that the class on Thursday is just going to be a link that will take you to a zoom room. You don't need to download anything. If you have Zoom on your computer, great. If you don't, it won't require that you download it. You could just watch it from the web. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Any other final questions before I send you all the loves and all the vibes to pass your exam? You love it. <laughs> I know. You fell in love with me before I fell in love with your voice. I did not. You watched me I for just hours. I watched every video. How many times? I didn't listen very well. I just watched them. <laughs> <laughs> With I that. Have, I have to admit. Anyway. All right. Love you all. Send you all the loves, all the vibes to pass your exam. You guys are the best. And uh, join the Facebook group so we can help you out more there. Have a good day. Bye. <laughs> Not surprised. <laughs>